Um, and I just want to say thank you to the Associated Students of Clark College for the generous funding that put on this program. We've been lucky enough to host John Zappas on campus today, who's done some uh, workshops, a monitor workshop this morning, and a singing making workshop in the afternoon that some of you guys have participated in. Um, John is coming up from Los Angeles. He's an artist uh, working in multimedia down there. He's a sculptor. Um, painter, printmaker, and works in various media. Uh, he's got his MFA from the Cranbrook Academy of Art um, and has participated in residencies at the Scohegan School of Painting and Sculpture, also the Bean Center for Contemporary Art, um, and has exhibited widely across the country. Um, so please join me in welcoming John Papa. Thank you guys so much for coming out, and thank you for hosting me. It's been a really fun day. I just want to get a timer going so I have some bearing on what's happening uh, <laughs> as I flail through these slides. Um, what I've prepared for you guys today is just to, you know, uh, eat and everyone can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, is, is a primer on the art that I've been making in the last four or five years, and uh, I decided to go reverse chronological order for some reason. It just seemed interesting. Because I just opened this exhibition that you see on the screen on the 7th. So I don't, was that a week ago? Um, here's my timer. <laughs> Forgive me. Oh, it's too much. Just tell me when I need to stop talking. Um, so, anyways, let me run, run you through what I was working with with this show. Um, so, this is at a gallery in San Luis Obispo, California, which is actually my hometown uh, where I grew up. And uh, it's an artist run space, so it, it, there's a painter there who also you know, makes his money as a landscaper and is able to find a storefront gallery downtown. And he invited me to do a show, someone I've known for a few years. And um, for this exhibition, I decided to continue a, uh, a suite of drawings that, um, you know, that I've been developing this sort of line where I'm drawing these oil sticks uh, for a number of years. These, These ones are on melamine panel. Melamine you know, is, is like a cheap particle board uh, laminate product that IKEA furniture is made out of, or these tabletops, for example. Um, and then the central form is, is uh, it's actually, a, it's called straw thrones, as you know, the piece, and it's an actually functional seat that viewers to the gallery you can come sit on to enjoy the work. Um, and it's constructed out of these straw bottles, is what they're called, and they're for erosion control. Um, and, and so, so with this exhibition, it's, it's kind of funny to go reverse chronological because you're going to start to see where some of the stuff came from as we go forward. But um, materially, I have an interest in, in things that are common or uh, everyday or, or maybe not everyday. In this case, the straw models are very specific and has a very you know, intentional um, way of being in the world. And, and so really that is a fruitful form that I like to just to see, see if there's some new way to look at something. Um, and I was also was interested in, in sort of monumentality of the gesture of making the throne and that it's open for a few people to sit at to enjoy the place that I've set up with the drawings and also uh, it, it sort of talk about maybe what it means to, to sort of uh, to sit on the throne, to do something from that vantage point of power um, and to extend that to the, to the digital gallery. So, so also the, with that, that notion of monumentality, I've tried to flip that a little bit because this is made out of straw and it's like probably not, not going to survive the show. Um, you can, can see a little bit of hay collecting on the floor around it just you know, with the open when the image is shot. The other thing I mentioned about this before, I think this is a bit through some of those. Just got out. Before, Before I show you some of the drawings, is that they are able to be hung in four, four orientations, and so that um, changeability is really a really productive thing as well. well. I, don't I don't really like, like a fixed um, meaning or, or stasis you know, configuration with these things. things. So here's just some of the drawings um, closer. And, and, and these things, things are also constructed, constructed out of a repetitive, looping, spiraling line. For me, when it comes to drawing, I, I like to think about drawing as a record of action and as a, as a sort of uh, imprint of such a discrete moment in place and an attitude of a maker for myself when I'm there. And so the, the, the action and the sort of path that comprises this set of words is essentially the same in each one, 
there's a multitude of interpretations and ways that they hang on the wall to build up into something. Um, also, also uh, with the exams, I was looking and thinking a lot about, about um, language and the way that there is a, a very rigid meaning, meaning attached to the letter, letter forms and words, but also there's an implied meaning that's communicated outside of the form of the letter in the example of the university. You are a hieroglyphic or an illuminated manuscript where that capital, first capital, is embellished in some of the details in the story. Though these have no direct linguistic you know, interpretation, I was thinking about, about all these things as a way to generate this body of work and think about, about what, what outside of the single form that generates, generates all of this can be told. Um, so here's some more of these things. I'll blast through. So this is another question from the here. Um, as you can see, there's some phones involved in this. <laughs> um, and, and the form itself is constructed, it's hollow, and it's constructed out of plaster with um, some uh, chicken wire and cardboard and different materials as an armature. And the correlation is just coming from a little bit of steel wool that I cut up and mixed in with the plaster that rusted to create that, that tone. Um, this, this is maybe the, the third, third or fourth iPhone piece that I've made, made. and for me, these ones are really, really an investigation in the contemporary uh, object of a phone that we all have in our pockets. But, but maybe trying to think differently about it and less, you know, from, from the uh, people in Silicon Valley would have to just, you know, really be in awe of what they pulled off. The iPhone is very expensive, don't get me wrong, but, but it, it is also, also just an object, an object. And, when and, when and when they break, they become different. And these are all my old phones, and my wife's old phones that become part of the structure. They're broken screens, they no longer are connected to the network, and no longer function, and they become different. So, in exploring that idea, um, all three of these phones, in one of the pieces on view, have a alarm that goes off. Um, and it's one of the pre programmed alarm sounds on the phone. And the combination of the three alarm sounds layering, and, and because they're all synced to Cupertino time, they completely perfectly sync up and form a sort of third soundtrack that is a combination of motorcycle, crystal, and uh, marimba drums. So it's, I don't have an audio clip for you today, but if you get three friends, you can probably try. <laughs> but I find that really fascinating the way that the, just within the phone, there's audio sound that it produced, and you can use that then as, as sort of this other. Aim was, 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 was the point of this sort of body of work. Um, and then, um, and then, then the I always like to try to think about, think about how the objects I make will live either in display or in the world. So, so I always try and contextualize the structure with a, with a plant or stand that, that is intended for it. So it's made out of four by fours that have been charred with a torch. And that's another process that I use on the sculptures a lot. We'll get to next. Each detail. detail. So that's the top, the top of the piece, and kind of where the, where the sound, sound emits from uh, um, on it. Back, back. Good. Good. Um, um, it's a little bit, but, uh, but this, this is, is in the, uh, the, the exhibition that I had in the fall of last year. The title of the show is Mind Lines. Um, similar, similar to the, to the first slide, slide I showed you, the, the sort of structure of the show, the show was this sweet 19 drawings that are again on this melamine material. And, and, and similarly, these ones, these ones can be hung in, a, in, a, in only a vertical orientation, but either way, so they basically flip. flip. Um, and, and in the show, the show there were seven places on the wall for the drawings, drawings but there were 19 total. So visitors to the gallery could come and change the entire hang of the show and come upon their own connections between the sort of thing that I presented in and that, that sort of conversation, conversation with the viewer is really important to me. Um, a lot, a lot of contemporary, contemporary art is fantastic, fantastic and academic and rigorous and interesting, interesting in a lot of ways, but requires a lot of uh, research, research and investigation on the viewer's part. And, and, and I'd, I'd rather maybe have, have a format of something that can be learned and experience and have to expand that way um, to sort of guide a viewer through an experience rather than saying there's this very specific path that must be followed to get to this conceptual treasure. treasure. Um, 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> some more images of the show are also several sculptures, and um, the bodies of sculpture that were presented in this show were two ashtrays and two chairs. So these sculptures are carved from wood. Um, I used to start with the chainsaw and then finish them with the chisel. And again, I draw a chart of the surface of the wood and, and seal it with a lacquer. So this piece, so this piece right here is an ashtray. And, um, Cigarettes, cigarettes can rest, rest on those two points, points and there's a you know, indentation for ashing. Um, um, and also, and also briefly, briefly in, in this moment, this moment about my interest, here's some of the close ups of the drawing that I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, basically, yeah. with the Astro stuff, stuff and the chairs, and the chairs it's, 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 a way it's a way to. Let's go back. This is the last one. Um, it's a way to it's break, down, break the down the wall between the viewer and the artist. And I just, it's a site of exchange. When you come, come and you sit down, you read differently than you can. And, and the similar thing, when you know, approach something, approach like, something like an ice tray, it's an object that facilitates the experience. Um, whether or not you agree morally with smoking tobacco or anything else, uh, it is for a, for a lot of people a site of meeting and talking and chatting. And, uh, Maybe breaking down some of the walls we have that are created by our isolation and fascination with technology or what have you. All of our, All of our own little microcosms that we live in every single day can, can be you know, coerced into uh, bumping up against each other through something like this, is my hope. Um, so, yeah, there's some of these problems, and then I'll get into this. This is a this show, is a show that, I that I made with my wife, wife Lindsay. Lindsay. Um, we, um, we, we are really bad, <laughs> really bad collaborators. <laughs> and you might not know it from the show, but we don't ever work, work together on art. Uh, um, we tried, we tried once, once, maybe six years ago, and it was a really rocky time. But for this show, we were asked to get together as part of a series of exhibitions of a couple artists. We work together in other ways and support each other in our creative endeavors. Always, obviously, but, uh, but uh, we don't ever work, you know, towards, towards the same, the same end. end. But, in but in this case, we were asked to do a show, and it was part, part, of, the part of the construct of the whole thing, thing was that we were a couple, and that it was, 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 was going to be the whole of us in the gallery, so we set up to do it. And um, we worked together, we worked together very briefly at the outset. Um, um, I produced some small little aluminum foil sculptures that she then photographed, and that's her process also in her photography, the body, she filters some of her Photoshop, and then she prints them, and then it's a very dynamic way of working, so in these images that were strung on these banners throughout the space, there's little bits of like hands or body parts that were created with a photo shoot, and she was processing through her digital manipulation in this case. So, for this show, we, we, we titled it uh, uh, Some Posters and Chairs, just very, just very simply. Um, and my contribution, and my contribution was, was the school stools that you see in the lower floor here. And, and this was when I really got uh, uh, all, all, all the way into carving um, in a big, big way. So this is the first sort of body of work that I produced in purely in carving, and that was in 2016, I think. I'll talk briefly about, about the, the, the wood, because, wood, because it, does it does mean something to me. I think you guys up in this part of the country, country can relate, but I, where, I where I live, it's basically like the landscape is in Southern California, it's a desert, it has kind of an apocalyptic Mad Max thing going on. Things are alive up here, and so there's a big contrast, but at the same time, what it brings to mind for me is how in this moment, this moment we have... Um, such, disparity such disparity between the absolute top of society, society and the absolute bottom. And we're kind of and living we're through, through simultaneous utopias and, and dystopias. So depending, depending on where you're sitting, society, society looks, looks very different right, right now. Um, and to, and to, that to that end, end I, I want to make work from a position that kind of acknowledges that in some way. So the so use of burning is, is symbolic, symbolic in that, that end. It is also a place to find pigment that is very immediate. I'm not applying paint to these things. They're just, just what, what they are in the material itself. itself. And it's more of the rush that way. It kind of presents itself. I don't have to make a decision. But then to that conversation of you know, contemporary, contemporary dystopia, dystopia, I want to use a material that has a little bit of an imprint from the culture that 
because that's the most, the most of the woods species, species that I choose, that I choose have, have met the trees, the trees have met their demise through the mechanisms of development, development of capitalism. So, so to give you an example, I've used a palm tree that was cut down to make way for some condos in Culver City. Um, this show is comprised, comprised of trees that we should have wood. Oak trees in the area I grew up in during the drought in California, in California drop, have dropped the entire limb that's this big around just because they can't support it. So there's some of that in there, and then there was Lisa Lipsis, which is an interesting cheese species in California. Um, and that the moment is being cut down, cut down to sort of reclaim the natural, natural uh, ecosystem, ecosystem in a lot of areas of the state. And then the third one is the last one uh, would be uh, pine, which is experiencing a lot of an epidemic of these beetles that are trying to create a lot of chop down a lot So I wanted to not just have a material that is blank, because no material really is, if you think about it. We are trained to think of raw or very pure, you know, you take bronze and it's like you make a church statue or something and it's supposed to just be a statue and not talk to you at all about what it's made out of, you should be convinced that it's flesh or something, but nobody is. Um, so everything's made out of something is my point and the material can tell you a lot about where and when it was made, I think that's really important. Um, the last thing I'll say about this was what a fun what a thing it was to travel, travel in the back. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, and have, to I didn't have to do it either. <laughs> yeah, the gallery, yeah, the gallery uh, they, uh, they, they paid for it and brought it in. It was amazing. But it was just, but it was just idea. an idea that we had to sort of ground the, the sculptures and change the space. We had kind of used the posters and the chairs to frame discrete zones throughout the gallery, which is a very narrow um, space and there were sort of different like sitting areas and the gravel also related to when I carved these things they existed in a field of shavings so it just felt really natural. Um, next, so here's uh, some of the individual shots. Um, this piece here is oak and did I mention that all of these are stools functionally that people can sit on them um, and did throughout the show and, and that's they're not super comfortable but <laughs> that's not the point. Um, yeah, this one here is eucalyptus and pine. And the whole series was just called stool with different numbers. What did you code it with? It's a lacquer. I spray it with a lacquer. Um, and it's, you know, you can buy it in a can at Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever, but uh, you can also buy a gallon and, and get a cup gun is what I use. And, you spray it on the piece, but um, it does, and, and just to, you know, spin off that a little bit, with my work in sculpture generally, there's, in art, art very generally as well, there's always a question of, will this hold up and last throughout time, and that's always like, why there are traditional materials such as oil and canvas, because those hold up very well against um, the erosion of time. And with this stuff, you know, like the most stable thing to make a sculpture that will last forever is maybe bronze or the casket, but uh, that's very expensive and I'm not very interested in having something last forever because as soon as, you know, uh, one of the most fun things about working in sculpture right now is seeing um, this conversation around statues in the South because this stuff is, is meaningful and we overlook um, these monuments in our everyday lives, but the Robert E. Lee statues are torn down and melted, you know, like a, a bronze statue, if, a, you know, the country is conquered 100 years later, it gets melted and turns into bullets, you know, like, <laughs> that's just how it goes. Uh, this stuff is not gonna be around forever, you know, and I don't, I don't really care. It changes through time, the patina changes, the, the lacquer's on there, but as you touch it and live with it, it's different every single time, and I think that is really of interest to me. Um, and similarly, you know, that, that exchange that I'm talking about where um, you're changed by it and it changes you. So, yeah, I don't know. You got one? Yeah. yeah uh, and I appreciate the questions. Just throw them at me. Yeah. yeah. So I yeah. Had a about the first, first I'm going to just blast that. Uh, awesome. I really like that specific. Yeah. So I was going to ask, for each exhibition, do you have different kinds of music you have no music playing? Good question. And I said this in one of the demos earlier, one of the reasons I'm an artist is because you can listen to music when you do art. <laughs> and that drew, drew me to art class as a young kid. Um, the drawings are, music is very important to the drawings. And you know, I, when I'm making them, maybe I should have gone into this, but 
it's a physical act. There, I'm, I'm in my body in that space, and I'm listening to music, and that music is influencing my my headspace. And then it's about feeling the material go down, and it's just really it, it sounds cheesy, but it's about the feeling of it. And and music is a really big part of that. And uh, t music for me. I took piano lessons as a kid, but I'm not like a musician. You know, I, I just am a huge fan. I have records and I make mixtapes and all of that. It's really important to me, but it's also just where I keep like the fun part. You know, like I don't want to muddy it with turning it into a career or something. Like it, the art is really great, but uh, music is, is pure for me. And I really love keeping it in the studio and going and definitely a huge, huge part of what I do. And I think generally, if you think about line, a line more abstractly as being a marker of time. It has a start and an end, a beginning and an end, a life and a death. And, and I think music is, is extremely time-based in that way. Um, so, great question. Any, anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. Does it feel like the I kind of like the uncertainty, and it's about that for me, you know? Like, these things present themselves as sculpture first, I hope, you know? It's, its form is striking but it seems to invite another kind of interaction on the subconscious level. Um, and, but usually in a practical sense, I'm either at the opening and I sit down on it or some, the gallery person, somebody breaks that seal and it just kind of goes from there. And particularly with the, this one where there was like this option to completely change the show. I didn't think people were gonna do it, but fortunately enough, it was like one of these first Friday opening things and there was a bunch of kids around and kids are not afraid, you know, and they're like, dad, I want that one on the wall. And he's like, let's do it. Um, so yeah, it, it was really with the interaction stuff. It is always kind of a question and it depends on the venue. Some places, you know, also with ashtrays, it's like certain very low key artist run spaces will be like, yeah, let's, let's use the ashtray during the opening and I'm all for it. Um, but others, you know, it's inside and they don't want to do that and that's fine. So it's, it changes, but I, there's sort of like a um, exhibition version, and then if these objects go into somebody's home or into life, then it's free for all. You know, they can do whatever the hell they want. <laughs> but yeah, anyone else before I keep it keep it cruising? Good question. Um, it's very simple construction, and it is hollow inside. It's I'm trying to get back there for you. Um, but it's made like a basket. It's just held together with twine. Yeah, just coil it up and uh, tied it with twine, kind of like interleaving through the, um, through the, through the rings of the coils. So. And, and just by the gravity of it, it rests on top of the, it's, it's in two pieces. There's like the cone portion and then there's the three rings of the base. And so that's how I moved it. I'm a control freak, you know? Like, you can see by this stuff, it's like, I don't know, if someone else wants it, some purple in there, I don't know about it, <laughs> you know? At least in this stage. Um, you know, it, it's just a matter of time, too. It, at this point, I'm, I'm kind of just very busy trying to keep it going forward, and I mean, like, that with the work, but also my life and, and making enough money to keep doing this stuff, and just as a side note, if you're interested, I make, I pay my bills by being an art installer, and I, I package up and ship artwork and do all that in Los Angeles for different galleries, but, uh, yeah, it, I don't really often, like, I'm not a good collaborator. Some people are just cut out for it, you know, and I am envious sometimes because it can be such a quicker way of working. Um, to bounce ideas off another person and to sort of like work two heads are better than one in a lot of ways, but um, yeah. How many times have you had to redraft your pictures? That's a really good question too. Uh, they're like one shot, you know, and some of them don't make it. And I come from a practice of sketchbook drawing, so usually like in the zine making workshop, we talked a little bit about it, but I'll fill an entire pad and there'll be a hundred drawings in there, but I'll only put you know, 12 into a zine or a publication. And, and the, uh, the ones on panel are kind of similar in that way where I might spend some time training, you know, and I'll get going on the paper. And then when it comes time to like get the panel out, then I, I kind of have an idea of where I'm going. And it's, there's no, there's not really an undo there. So if it's not working out, I try and like see if I can resolve it or I just have to go to the next one. But um, they aren't made as fluidly as they look. There's a series of 
lines and stopping and reacting. Sometimes I flip it, sometimes then I'll go back and pick that line up, you know, but I try to make it look like it's kind of, you know, one, one moment. And they're all executed in about 15 minutes a, per, a piece or something. So that, uh, that speed belies how much goes into the suite of drawings before. Like I'll spend three or four weeks doing sketches before I, like for the first show, for example, I keep going back. <laughs> these drawings, all 13 or 14 of these were done in one day, but I spent a month drawing before that. So yeah, go ahead. What the wood? Wood, uh, and I'll tell, when I was in graduate school, I worked a little bit more with mold making and plastics and some of these like, um, you know, more newer materials and they're very exciting for the result you can get, but there was an experience that I had where I was at a residency and I used some of this stuff in my studio and there was another person there who had built up an allergy to like a clear resin that I was using and she ended up having to go to the hospital and it really freaked me out, you know, I was, it, I was not using it properly and I didn't have the facilities and I didn't, I, I wasn't being, you know, safe about it and I, I done it was bad so I said let's get out of that stuff and look at look at something natural um, that with with the plaster and the wood that I work with you're only really worrying about a par particle that you might inhale and so you can wear a dust mask but with some of the other uh, synthetic materials the vapors can be really what are damaging and they're harder to, to deal with so that's that's kind of the thing there and I really just for whatever reason the natural renewable thing just synced up more with with my my values yeah um, but also you know these are melamine these are industrial produced but they're also made out of waste so like there's a fascination with what we deem um, waste as a society and what is trash versus versus treasure so I'm not getting to the next oh there we go I'm just hitting the wrong key so back to some of this stuff and keep jumping with the questions if you have them Here's another doc piece. Um, yeah, I think I kind of talked about what these are, but uh, this one was just one phone and the, the surface here in the detail you'll see more is created instead of by rust, it's by uh, it's copper leaf in the surface, which oxidizes to create that teal color. And um, yeah, I just really like that kind of like not having to make that decision of like exactly all the details of how this looks, kind of setting it up and letting it happen is really, is exciting to me. Um, similar to the rust and, and also it kind of taps into a conversation about, again, like the sculpture and how long it's really gonna be around. This stuff is kickstarted on the way to decay. <laughs> but, um, and here's another, this is uh, the second ashtray I made. Um, this one is carved from avocado wood, which, uh, again, to talk about that idea of the sourcing the wood, um, it came from a, uh, my mother-in-law's property in uh, East San Diego, and this was a property that had avocado orchards on it, and then um, the drought hit, and then the, um, the recession hit, and it was foreclosed on, and during that foreclosure period, the water was shut off, and essentially hundreds of avocado trees just died and uh, I had access to all this wood so <laughs> I tried to make something beautiful out of it um, and the wood itself has a, a really nice color and grain to it so this piece here um, the top portion actually like comes off and can be handed around to a group of people so again to activate people and bring them to a site and connect them around something is the interest with this stuff um, yeah so now we're back a little bit, a few years. This, this piece is jumping back to 2013. Um, this weird kickboard thing that I made. But you might not be able to see super well in the image, but it hangs on two sort of sharp wooden hooks. And there's a, a whole series of these things that I made. And they're produced by hollowing out a, a cavity in a sheet of styrofoam. Um, and here's a detail of the surface. So. Yeah, this is about, you know, just carving a little bit of an inch depression in some styrofoam sheeting, sprinkling some pigment in there. And this is back, I was talking about applying pigment and not really wanting to paint my sculptures. Um, this, was a, this is a little bit before that when I was exploring something else. So things can change over time. But yeah, I was, I was throwing pigment in the mold. I'd throw pigment in the plaster and then I would cast the thing and it'd be basically a unique object that was produced through a mold making process. Um, so yeah, the, the other thing that of interest with these works was a conversation that 
uh, around the difference between a painting and a sculpture. You know, a, a painting is associated with creating an illusionistic space, um, and a sculpture is associated with presence and material, um, typically. And with these, I was trying to do both and see what would, would happen. So here's another one. Um, and some of them are painted with bright colors on the back so that they have a little bit of a glow on the wall and that distance between the wall and like it, it really in person they kind of have a, a, a strange effect of not knowing whether the thing is protruding towards you or receding away. Um, they're sort of strange frustrating objects also because the hooks tend to rupture any illusion that happens. This is my first show in Los Angeles. Um, my friends wanted to start a gallery in their yard, and that was interesting to me. Um, because a gallery is very restricting in a lot of ways of who sees it and uh, you know who, who might even hear about it or, or walk past the thing. This was just in a neighborhood in part of Los Angeles called Montecito Heights, and uh, more specifically, in Montecito Heights, an area called the Happy Valley, <laughs> which is hilarious to me. And there's even a Happy Valley gang. Um, but this is in the yard and the view of the street. And uh, I worked on this piece for a month, this big cement um, thing. And so I was the first show in their, their yard gallery. And uh, I wanted to frame the space and contain it a little bit because it was just a yard. But I also wanted to acknowledge the site, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't a white cube gallery. There's people who walk by this and, and I was a guest there. And so I wanted to, to make a gesture uh, towards that and acknowledgement of that. And so this was the first uh, throne piece and the, the, the first slide was the second throne piece, but this one's called Wide Throne. And um, yeah, I just, the idea of a throne for more than one person was kind of exciting enough to carry this whole thing for me and it still excites me um the form of it i think is is really fun too but that's <laughs> i don't know it's like a lumpy lumpy elephant thing um and then there's like that black object is the first carving that i did and that's an ashtray card from palm wood um there's a closer shot also charred but this show stayed outside for three months um so I had to kind of think a lot differently about material and what could last in, in that, that equation of like, you know, we're talking about is, it, is bronze going to last really forever or, or whatnot. Um, so this piece, it was just charred. It wasn't coated with anything. And by the end of it, it totally had changed. You know, there's more brown patches. And, and I really welcome that development of the patina and, and it changing through time. I haven't seen the cement piece, but I would hope there's like... I mean, if it were here, there'd be moss growing on it, and that would be amazing, but <laughs> I'm sure it's weathered somewhat. Uh, trying to go to the next one. Oh, too fast. Anyways, here's the drawings from the show, and these were on aluminum, um, which solved that problem of weathering for me on that front, um, because any sort of wood panel or paper wouldn't sustain any exposure to moisture, but aluminum doesn't rust, and just drew with it an oil stick straight on there and tapped it to the stucco wall. Here's another one of these. This is the most recent hooked work that I've done. And I was pushing out of the um, pigmentation style and the, the hanging object is hand form versus uh, cast into a, a disposable mold. Um, but yeah. Here's a detail. Trying to get to the end. <laughs> Maybe I'm pressing too hard. There we go. A couple drawings. I'll just blast through these. I want to get to the um, last show. I'm trying to blast through these. <laughs> Well, I guess I'll talk about this one. <laughs> this is a drawing. These are all kind of 2013. Um, and you can see some similarities between the drawings on panel that I did and these, though they're on paper. I really love framing. It uh, has a way with a pedestal of contextualizing what you've done and, and placing it in sort of a permanent 
home. Um, so these ones, you can, you can sort of see a little line on the edge of the frame, but I actually just sort of shaved the corner of it off to soften the hard line of it. I don't really like straight lines very much. I don't know if you can tell. This piece is carved out of particle board and it hangs on these Ikea curtain hangers. And this one is called Time Snake. This is from 2013. I did a show in Portland, Maine and was staying with a family and they had lost uh, some pine trees on the property and had the wood milled. So I had about two weeks to make the work before the opening of the show. And from a very simple drawing of a, a sort of segmented spiral, I just set out to, to make it out of wood and cut all the angles by hand and then just hammered dowels through the joints to make this thing that would stand and it kind of concluded when I ran out of time. Um, and then I just painted some stain on it to accentuate the form. This is a show I did in New York where I made all of the work in the space in the span of a month. So kind of to loop back to your question about music, I, I maybe wish I was a musician. And with this, I proposed I was going to make all the space, all the, all the work in the space. And I was thinking about how musicians get to go on tour and how that is awesome because you just go out there with your, your instrument and you just do your thing and you don't need a studio, you don't need facilities and all these things. So I brought my tool bag and I just showed up to make the work. Um, so this piece in the foreground is just MDF that I, I wheeled from the Home Depot around the corner and uh, cut out the shape. It actually is just freestanding. It's two pieces glued together so it's about an inch and a half thick. And then I burned the surface with a Bic lighter um, to create the polka dot pattern. Um, here's a, another view of the gallery, and uh, I'll take the detail of that piece. <coughs> the um, there you go. Really enjoyed the way the flame kind of bent around the form. These pieces are part of a, a body of work where I was. It maybe was the beginning of the interest in finding uh, inherent pigment in the material I was using, like I'm talking about with using uh, the, the charred surfaces on the wood pieces. So with these, it kind of all started, I was on a road trip chewing on some blue corn tortilla chips and I like pulled that out of my mouth and was like, that's a cool color <laughs> and texture. And so these are chewed tortilla chips and rainbow sprinkles make this purple color and I mix in some Elmer's glue and then there is it's just a thin skin over an armature so the objects themselves are plaster and um, then they're sort of just coated with this uh, mixture of chewed food and Elmer's glue and again the, the question of time how long things last and these are loaded with preservatives and the Elmer's glue is like a, actually a natural antibiotic uh, or antibacterial so um, they lasted for some years. The color fades a little bit, but they all bit the dust in a storage unit. Some rat had a feast on all of these pieces. <laughs> I mean, I knew they were going to go away from the outset, but I was surprised how long they lasted. <laughs> these are some colored pencil drawings from the, the show. And this is another one of those chewed food pieces. This one is um, popcorn and Fruit Loops. And so obviously with Fruit Loops, you get a whole color palette. So I think I was using the, the blue and yellow to get this shade, but I did a whole like swatch of different colors you can get. <laughs> Sorry? Mostly. I enlisted some help sometimes because I was just like, your jaw starts hurting and there's just only so much you can stand. <laughs> and this is the very first one that I made. Um, but. In this one, the, the base of it is an MDF pedestal that's been burned with a lighter um, to create that texture. And the triangular portion is just plywood, but the, the black is some nail polish. Um, and the arced portion is red hot or uh, flaming hot Cheetos and blue corn tortilla chips over wire. Um,
there's I just continue to have this interest in what's at arm's length and what's around the house and what what can be transformed and what is uh, again what we deem as valuable as a society and, and trying to flip that you know create something different. This this is my first show. It was in Little Rock, Arkansas, where my friend had opened a gallery, uh, and yeah, it was. It was a, a fantastic time. I made most of the work while in residence at Venus and some of these recent slides are from there. Um, but yeah, now I just, after this, I'm going to end with some like non-art stuff because I don't know what you guys are all into in your studies, but the stuff that I've made and showed you is really great and exciting, but I think if you're creative, you should do some other stuff too. So I, about a year ago, I started making these pots uh, that are made out of uh, a plaster mixed with sand. It's like a white cement. And I, while the material is mixed, it's like a liquid and it just starts hardening into like mud. And in that moment between mud and solid, you just about 10 minutes where you can work with it. And uh, so I just make these vessels and, and pot them with plants. And it is just very exciting for me because I don't have to think so hard about it. And it's like all done, the sculpture's there. <laughs> But it can be generative and you're practicing and honing your skills, it's like cross training or something, you know. Um, I take what I learned doing this stuff and bring it back to the artwork when it's time to make art. So, anyways, uh, this is also another way for people to engage with my work. And, and like I said, I'm super un uncomfortable just being a person who just shows in a gallery and it's only for sale to people who have so much money. Um, these things are for, for, for everyone else. They're $30 to $100 or reasonable. And I do sales out of my studio. And look at that plant. It's just, I can't make anything that cool. So that's how I'm going to end. That's the last slide. Um, <laughs> if there's any more questions, I'm really more than happy to, to feel right now. Go ahead. So, at what stage did you decide that you wanted to move into the art? How drastic has your art changed? Mm, it's a great question. Um, and I didn't really fill this in. My, my background, my undergrad is in graphic design, and I graduated into the recession, and the jobs were not really happening as, as I kind of hoped they might be. So I said, if I'm going to be not making money, I may as well make it, you know, make my stuff. So uh, pretty immediately after, I started a collective with uh, some friends and my wife, and we started doing pop up shows in San Diego, and just got excited about more of an art direction possibilities there. And so from there, I uh, moved home real quick to my parents and we spent six months putting a portfolio together and that was like when I started making art. And I got into grad school and, and for me, it, I, I didn't really know this was exactly what I wanted to do. When I, would, I didn't even know about the, any of this, you know, the contemporary art world until I was finishing undergraduate and I went to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Um, and to talk about the way my work has changed, it's been quite significant. This pre presentation here spans between, um, <coughs> excuse me, 2012 and this year, so five years. And before that, the stuff I was making in school was was pretty different looking. It was a lot more um, illusionistic, troploy even. You know, the surfaces were highly rendered, and everything was meant to sort of deceive you and. To, what it was actually made out of. Uh, and I've, I, it was a path that I really had to investigate and check out where it went, and then it pushed me where I am now. So I don't know if that helps you at all, but uh, it changes a lot. Yeah, it changes a lot. And that's okay. You know, I, I don't know. It's nice to be consistent and still have a feel like your stuff, but it's, you know, it also is depending on once you get into it on, on what opportunities you have. You know, it, I was kind of feeling like with my sculpture that would, when I started doing these pots that there was sort of a limited reception to where those things could go and um, a pot can go a lot more different of a route through worlds and through space and through, through uh, yeah, people I guess so um, choosing choosing how you insert your work into the world, it, you have that power and agency always I think and that's, that's important.
They're just at my house. <laughs> you gotta come to LA. Um, yeah, I, and with the way that, yeah, I, I've been kind of deliberate. I don't want to put them in urban outfitters, you know, as I'm not trying to just make money. I, it's, it's emotional for me. I want it to be personal. I want people to come, maybe put in a little bit of effort and see, you know, the whole, because I usually have between 60 and 100 plants at my house available, and people just, you know, will come for dinner and they'll check it out. Wow, I gotta take this home. So, and then twice a year, or so I, I have a sale like around the holidays. But um, if you're in LA this year, <laughs> I will be doing one at a gallery called The Pit. So that's kind of exciting too, as I've done them at my home and my studio. But uh, I'll be doing them at, at a gallery, and they're commissioning a couple work pieces for out in front. So, um, you know, they're not showing my sculpture, but that's just another example. They're not gonna give me an exhibition, but my work is gonna be there. And so it's a little back door. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on down to LA. It's going to be on the 16th and 17th of December. <laughs> I'll see you there. This is great. <laughs> I never thought that would happen. Right on. Quick plug. <laughs> yeah. All right. And, and you can talk to me after. I'll hang out.